Okay, good afternoon. Um, Van Dijk and his studio. I will start with a small anecdote. Um, in 1631, a Dutchman, Balthasar Gerbier, a painter, a draftsman, a dealer who worked most of his time in England, um, bought a painting uh, from the Brussels art dealer and painter Salomon Noveliers to give it as a present to uh, the English king Charles I. It might be this painting, but it's not completely sure. Um, it represented Mary and Child and St. Catherine, and he thought it to be a major work of Anthony van Dijk. The painter himself, so van Dijk, had said that it was a copy. In first instance, we have the inclination to follow directly van Dijk's view. It's, it's very rare that we have van Dijk saying something about his own paintings, and he says it's a copy. Uh, but are we right to follow him? Salomon Nobelius told Herbier that he know, knew of no comparable work by Van Dyck next to a painting he had sold to Holland. Rubens had said that this painting in Holland was inferior to the work which was now in the possession of Herbier, which, according to Rubens, showed Van Dyck at his utmost, at his best. Nobelius suggested that Van Dyck had reasons, reasons to downgrade the painting and also Herbier thought that Van Dijk wanted to play a nasty trick with him, just so both thought it would be a major work by Van Dijk. Both considered to be a great work. Who was right is impossible to say at the moment, but it shows how very careful we have to be with documents, even if they come directly from the painter himself. Nobly has wrote that he didn't know any painting by Van Dijk with the same subject, same composition and measurements, except from the one in Holland. So, the main sujet, dessin et grandeur. Clearly, these three points were for him of great importance to know if a painting was or could be a copy. I will return to these three points later on because they can be of help to understand what Van Dijk and his contemporaries sought to be copies and what not. You might think that, theoretically at least, it is pretty, pretty easy to say what is in the 17th century people consider to be a copy or an original. But, as we will see, it's not always the case, and especially not with Van Dijk. In the coming hour, I will talk about how the young Van Dijk worked, and especially about his studio. What do we know about it? And can we see in his paintings assistants at work? Is the difference in style between paintings attributed to Van Dijk sometimes, at least, to be explained by the help of assistants, or is it just Van Eyck, Dijk working in different styles? For long, art historians have been aware of the unreliability of the eye, but the anecdote I just told you makes us aware that documents, even if they are very closely related to the artist, should also not be taken at face value. In the coming hour, I will talk about a whole range of documents that also should be used with cautiousness. The anecdote makes also clear that during his lifetime, there were copies of Van Dijk circulating, and that even connoisseurs were not sure to, dis dis to distinguish between copy and an original. Of course, the story is of around 10 years after the period we are dealing with in this exhibition, uh, but, as we will see, around 1620, the same problems already occurred. When walking through the exhibition, and I hope you already did, one of the things that strikes most is the sketchiness of most of the paintings of Van Dijk. In some of his paintings, he almost looks like a proto-impressionist, and here I have at right a painting by Manet. You might get the idea that he just painted the people he saw on the streets of Antwerp with his fast brush and used them for his biblical scenes. The idea of Van Dijk as somebody who painted his figures from real life, just as he saw them, seems to be supported by a story which was told by Jan Breugel the Younger in 1660, uh, who was from a very early age a very good friend of Van Dijk. There is a document who says he, I, I was already with him when he was a child, so they really played together when, when very young. Thus, he must be a very reliable witness. At some time, presumably in 1619 or 1620, he visited the studio of Van Dijk and recognized in the figure Van Dijk was painting, 
he recognized his uncle. It might be this painting, we are not completely sure. And he thought it was the engraver Peter de Jode. Bruegel asked Van Dijk what he was doing, whereupon he answered that he would make it into a beautiful apostle. So it really looks as if he had somebody in front of him, his uncle Peter de Jode, and then he painted this apostle, just like the Impressionists did. The sketchiness of Van Dijk's work suggests a quick way of working, and indeed, Van Dijk must have worked fast and hard. Already in his early years, he was a prolific artist, a very prolific one. Also, Alejandro told you already. From his early years, before he went to Italy, that is, say, from 1615, 16 to 1621, thus in six years, he painted more than 150, 160 paintings, and that is without the work he did for Rubens. Most other artists need a whole life to make such an enormous amount of work. So, just as a comparison, Vermeer, a Dutch artist, only painted 36 paintings we know of, and he already in five years, Van Dijk painted 150. So, very prolific. Alejandro had just given you an overview of what he made during his early years, Van Dijk, from his earliest portrait from 1613, when he was just 14 years old, to his late works from 1621. In this lecture, I will not concentrate on his portraits, but on his other works. His paintings with mythological and above everything biblical subjects, they were seen at that time, and Christopher Brown already told you, as the most important subjects a painter could work on. Portraits were more seen as a kind of necessity to earn money. It is thus in this work that the ambitions of the young artist become most clear. One of the most characteristic features of the oeuvre of the young Van Dijk is the occurrence of versions of one and the same compositions. And I just show you them rather quickly, but we will ret return to them very, in a very short time. So this is the aberration of the shepherds from Potsdam, and next to it is the one from the Courtauld Gallery in London. Then you have the two St. Jerome's who are here in the show, the one from Rotterdam and the one from Stockholm. I will deal quite a lot about these two paintings because I researched them quite a lot with colleagues in Stockholm and of course also with Alejandro. Then the two paintings uh, with the Lamentation, the two St. Sebastian, the one in the show from Edinburgh and the one in Munich which alas couldn't come. Then you have the two uh, paralytics, the one with the English Queen and the one in uh, the Gemälde de Samlung in Bayern. Then the two uh, betrayal of Christ, the two Saint Jerome's, one in Dresden, which is in the show, and one which is in a private collection and hangs now in Scotland. Of course, the three versions of the betrayal of Christ, and then the enormous amount of apostles. Just these are two examples as Jude, but we have about 60 paintings of apostles still in existence. Within short, I will return to this phenomena of several versions, because it is there where we might find the most easy, where we find most easy the help of assistance and get an idea of how his study worked. I certainly don't want to say that there was no help of assistance in work of which there is just one version, no, or, on the other hand, that we have to expect the hand of an assistant in second or third versions. Clearly, it is possible that Van Dijk was also responsible for a second and third version on his own, without the help of assistance. When having several versions, or at least one, however, it is easier for the art historian to compare. The composition is the same, so one can really concentrate completely on how the paint is handled. If we can't find differences in handling of the paint within different versions, it seems out of the question that we would be able to find different hands in painting where there's just one version. <laughs> to be short, several versions make the connoisseur's task just a little bit easier. But first, I will look at uh, how Van Dijk prepared his large compositions. How did he start? How did he come to his compositions? A remarkable future, and Alejandro already told you, is that uh, Van Dijk almost always starts with a composition of Rubens. Here are just two examples. Alejandro already showed you uh, the drunken Silenus from Munich and the one in Dresden, which is in the show. On the other hand, uh, you see the Moses and the Brazen Serpent. That's in the court of the gallery from Rubens, and that's the one 
which is in the show and of course in the Prado. Um, from this starting point, so from this Rubens composition, he tried to find another solution for the composition. He did this with making drawings. It's not unusual that we have still five or six preparatory drawings for one painting. It's really with these drawings that one seems to look over the shoulder of the young artist and really sink in how he should solve the problem or how to come to composition. I will give you just one example, and that's of this major painting, uh, the carrying of the cross for St. Paul's Church in Antwerp. Presumably, he made the painting when he was 18, 19, around 16, 17. It belongs to a series of 15 paintings for the Church of St. Paul, and it shows the all 15 paintings, the mysteries of the rosary. 11 Antwerp painters contributed, among them Hendrik van Baalen and Rubens. Uh, the series, as you know, is still in the northern ale of the church, so you can still see them all together. Only the Caravaggio, which was, makes also part of the series, or was at least also in the church, is now in Vienna. Um, for this painting, there are more preparatory drawings than for any other composition we know of Van Dijk. Um, nine compositional drawings and one study for one of the figures. So that's really a lot. This sequence of the drawings is very difficult to establish. And I just give you the sequence which Anne-Marie Logan, who uh, wrote about the drawings in the catalog, uh, she thinks uh, this is the sequence of the drawings. It, it's extremely difficult because he uh, makes a composition, he draws, and then he changes it, and then he, some figures reappear after three or four reappear again. So it's very hard to, uh, to really see how, how he worked and what the exact sequence is, but it might be this sequence. Uh, this is a small drawing from Turin, and um, you see Christ is going the other way, which is pretty remarkable. I think Van Dijk from the start must have known that he should have walked from left to right, but it might be that his first ideas were from the other. We see it quite often that he uses kind of mirror image. It's what a thing he plays with quite often. So also with compositions of Rubens, sometimes he just makes a mirror image and then he starts to get his own ideas. Um, the Virgin is uh, still standing on the other way, but Christ is already looking to her, and Simon of Kyrene is carrying the cross. We will see later that he reappears in, in different positions. And also the man with the rope on the left is already there. He will be at the right at the end, but he's still already there, but he will disappear also. This is a very uh, small sketch on the verso of a Berlin drawing, which is very hard to see, but it might be, it's, it's certainly close to the Turin one. And again, it's from right to left, and there the Virgin is still standing. And um, the, the Christ is really showed, uh, fallen under the weight of the cross. The third one, and that's the first large composition drawing, is from Providence, and it's very highly finished. It might be the first really solved a solution for the composition. It's still from right to left, and uh, the Virgin is standing now on the other side, and so Christ is walking to her, say more or less. Um, a Roman soldier urges, urges him to go along. Let's see if I can, yeah, here. He will disappear completely uh, later on. Um, it's a very in intriguing uh, sketch. It, it's first he made a very quick sketch with black chalk from Dijk, then pen and brush, and then he continues to work on it with blue chalk. So it's happening quite a lot in this drawing. This might be the next one, the next in the sequence. This is a very, very small sketch on the recto or the verso of the Turin sketch we, we saw at the first. And there you see he goes from left to right and the Virgin is still standing there. So here he has turned it the way it uh, finally will become. This drawing, which is very uh, in best condition, very abraded, is in, in a Dutch private collection. It is uh, already much closer to the, to the final painting. Mary is now at the foot of the cross, as you see. Still Simon of Kyrene and not 
yet the soldier with outstretched hands is visible, and Christ is pulled with a rope around his neck and turns his head at his grieving mother. And already the man with the typical helmet is there, and of course he would change the direction, but the man is there for the first instant. A very beautiful drawing, I think, is the one in Liu. It's in horizontal format, and uh, as you see, he tries to find new solutions. This figure is there. The Virgin is, is really one of the most beautiful figures I know. It's, I think, more moving than the final figure, but it's, it's staggering. Um, after the Lille, presumably, the Charles Boris drawing comes of, well, hey, right. This is first, sorry, I went too quick. This is pretty close to the, the, the Lille drawing. Um, what you see, it, it's close to it, but some figures are added, like this figure who is carrying the cross, a very strong person, which is just in this drawing and never again. And which is most, perhaps most remarkable, the Christ is looking forward or to the ground and not to Mary as in most of the others. So he really tries to find solutions and changes all the time. After the Devonshire drawing, uh, presumably this drawing from Bremen was made. It's lost, unfortunately, but it's already very, very close to the final painting. Uh, it simplifies in one way the Charles was drawing. Charles is again looking back at Mary and the outlines of the principal figures are really strengthened uh, and a lot is still done with the brush. The final drawing is the one in Edward. It's a very bad image, but it's the final Modelo. I hope you can see it has, it's squared, so it was really used to trace the uh, painting or the drawing or use it as the, the final composition for the painting. Christ looks back at Mary, who now has folded her hands as in the painting. Simon of Kyrene is back again, assisting Christ, and there are a lot of details. Also, here are differences with the final painting. Some of the figures in the right uh, are, are left out in the drawing and are also left out in the painting, and some of the feet in the right corner are left out and only can be seen in the painting. So this is the final sketch. After he had made the sketches, like Rubens, he made some uh, black chalk drawings of some of the figures. And this is the only one we have for this painting. It shows the man with the outstretched arms. Uh, you see four separate studies of his right arm, and he used the one in uh, the middle. This is the one he used, finally. And this is the hand of the, the left hand, which he also painted. So here you can see uh, Van Dijk in these more than 10 drawings. You see him experimenting with direction, with horizontal, vert vertical, with which figures and where to place them. You, you, he did this kind of searching for all his important compositions. It is really, if we see him thinking how he should solve it, this kind of searching and changing uh, we also find in his paintings, however less than in his drawings. These drawings, where he sings and re-sings, where he comes back on earlier solutions, is very, very typical for Van Dijk. It's something Rubens didn't do. It seems as Rubens could invent this composition completely in his mind and was able to draw or paint it in one go and clearly didn't need to change much. Rubens' favorite medium was the old sketch on panel as a preparatory for his large paintings. Van Dijk never or hardly ever made oil sketches in his early period. His medium, that's clear, was the drawing. Next to drawings, Van Dijk, Van Dijk used preparatory, as a preparatory for his large compositions, oil, oil studies of heads, as we call them in uh, Dutch, tronies. He made them most of the time, it seems, with oil on paper. Only later were these studies glued onto panel on canvas. Uh, very likely after Van Dijk's death. So when he were in his own studio, they were presumably just on paper only. Um, his studies of Hess must be, have been already during his time, uh, lifetime very popular. Also, Rubens had a series of them, very likely made when Van Dijk worked at his place. 
Sometimes these tronies must have been made with a special composition in mind. But more often, it seems that Van Dyck and Rubens just made a quick sketch in oil of a character they liked, which they found schilderachtig, picturesque, or worthy to paint. Often, they painted one and the same figure, one and the same head, in several positions, as you can see here. These sketches were held in the studio and could be used at any time. And there's a wonderful letter of Rubens, who is staying at that moment in his castle outside Antwerp, and he writes a letter to one of his assistants in the studio in Antwerp and says, please bring me that and that uh, study of tronies because I need it for a painting. So he really used them to paint the heads in his large compositions. Uh, i just give you again some examples, uh, but I could give you a lot more. Here you see uh, these two heads which are in the show from the Rockox house in Antwerp. And here you see in a mirror image the same figure. This you have already seen. Oops, uh, this goes very fast. Um, here you have this perhaps St. Madeline, but clearly it was first just a study of a head. And there, of course, you see her again uh, as one of the figures around the Silenes. A nice example, again, is the uh, big painting from Ottawa, the Suffer Little Children to Come Unto Me. And there we have two sketches, one for the young boy and one from one of the apostles, with the one in the left you see just in profile. The same uh, study of tronies, of two tronies, was used for two apostles, one for Philip, that's the one on the right from Vienna, which is in the show, and Ram below, which is in the Getty, which shows uh, Simon. So he really used them very uh, economical. And uh, here again, you see it's not completely the same, but this, the, the figures do resemble. You see here, well, where is my pointer here? This, fig well, <laughs> this figure, of course, is very similar to that one, and this is also pretty similar. So he must have used them all the time just to show, to paint his heads. So drawings and oil studies of heads were the things Van Dyck used for his large historical compositions. I have already said that Van Dyck used as a starting point very often a composition by Rubens, which he then started to change. Rubens was his master, the person to work with, but also the figure to compete with. Before anything else, Van Dyck tried to be different in style from his master, but not always. Van Dyck was a real chameleon, if one looks to his style. During his years with Rubens, he had learned to paint just like his master, as of course he was supposed to do as a member of the workshop of Rubens. And you have heard it already two times. He worked for the Decius Must cycle, and presumably he was uh, involved in the castle Virgin and saints. And there, of course, it's extremely close to from R Ruben's style, so close that it's sometimes very hard to see if there's any Van Dijk at all. Also, sometimes in his own compositions, he clearly sticks to the style of his master. The best example is the Saint Martin, but also the Christ and the paralytic is very close in style to Ruben's. The nice thing is that we have for both a second version, which is much more in Van Dijk's own style, at least parts of it. That's to say, a rough and very clearly visible brushstroke. Here you have the example of the St. Martin, uh, the second version, which is in the Royal Collection in England, and especially the figures on the right, which are not in the Southampton painting, are very roughly, in very rough brushstrokes, are very uh, close to what Van Dijk uh, the, the typical Van Dijk rough style. The same holds true for these two versions. This is the second. This is the version of the Royal Collection, which is in the show, and this is again the one from Munich, which is closer to Van Dijk's own style. So we are back again with second four versions. Some of them are almost identical, like this one, the Lamentation of Christ. And like the St. Jerome, it's hard to find any difference between the two. But perhaps you have already noted when I showed you some of them, of those several versions at the beginning, that they are hardly ever directly the same. 
As said, some differ in style, like the paralytic and the St. Martin, but that's not all. They both also have changes in composition. In the paralytic, the figure on the right is changed, and the paralytic got a beard. This is changed, and this is changed, and it is, um, and also the architecture is a little bit different. If you look very close in the exposition to this, uh, there we go again. Yeah, no, no. Let me see if I. Um, if you look close to the painting in the exhibition, uh, my goodness, you can see that the, the heaven goes on behind the wall and that the figure, the paralytic, had a beard in the first instance. So it looks like the one in Munich was the first version and then he paints the more Rubensian one. It seems so, of course, you can invent an idea that it was the other way around. But it looks like at least that this painting was in first instance closer to the one at the right. Uh, the other way, uh, it looks like these two paintings from Zaventem. Of course, there you see changes with the figure on the right, but also the way uh, the sword is held by St. Martin. But here it looks like the Rubensian is the first, and then the Moor van Dijkin is the second. So it seems that he could change this kind of thing. Um, and they have already been shown to you on uh, the crowning of thorns, where, of course, the figures, at the, especially at the left, have completely changed. And the Silanes in Brussels, which are really different, but the figure of Silanes is almost the same and has also the same measurements. Um, recent research of the technical lab in the Prado have made clear that Van Dijk must have used a kind of technique to copy, to copy his compositions. Sometimes the whole composition, sometimes the figures, and sometimes just the heads. They have exact the same measurements in the two or three versions. There were several techniques to transfer a composition. When the original was smaller, often a grid was used. Hmm, I like the one uh, I showed you already. As we have seen, the last drawing of the carrying of the cross was traced, and we have several other drawings with this grid on it, so it was really used to uh, copy the painting in a larger format. But uh, with copying something that would get the same measurements, there's a technique which is more simple and more reliable, tracing. And tomorrow morning you will hear much more about this technique, but just one example because it's so important for the understanding of Van Dijk's studio. At the right, you see a study head Trony in Paris, which could not travel. There you see the Saint Jerome, and in blue, the measurements of the <coughs> sketch uh, from the Louvre. So it's more or less the same measurements. And then here you have the, the Rotterdam at the right, the Stockholm one on the left, and as a tracing, the, uh, the, the Rotterdam painting put on top of it. So it's very close. It's not exactly the same, but especially the head, it's... it's to the millimeter, it's the same, the head of the angel and of St. Jerome. Some, something must have been used, and presumably it was a kind of tracing. But what kind of tracing you will hear tomorrow? Why? Why did Van Dijk make several four versions of his composition? In the first place, the making of copies was something extremely normal in his time. But most of the time, the second or third version are rather stiff repetitions of the earlier version, and most of the time, they are clearly recognizable as work of assistants or followers. But not so with Van Dijk. He clearly made much work in making them look as originals, as seemingly quickly, quickly painted original works. Uh, here, for example, the St. Jerome again from Rotterdam and Stockholm. Look at the very sketchy still life in the right-hand corner, and they are also a little bit different, but they are really painted very fast in both versions. Not only he tried to imitate the sketchiness of the first version, he also changed things, as we have seen, so that the first and later versions were not identical. In that way, he must have been able to sell them as original new compositions. Originals were valued higher than copies. Thus, just by small or bigger changes, he could earn more money. But Perhaps it was not always just economics. We have seen that with his drawings, he liked to change. It seems something very typical of him, 
just to continue, well, to continue with changing things all the time. The characteristic can be seen in his paintings when looking at X-rays. A good example, and Alejandro already showed you, <coughs> is the crowning of thorns. Um, unfortunately, the first version in Berlin is lost, but we have the photograph. Uh, with the second version in the Prado, he started with the Berlin ver version and afterwards changed a lot. Another example is the Saint Jerome. And this is uh, pretty remarkable. You see there in the left with the angel a kind of uh, ham, hamon. But if we turn it, we see it's the arm of a painting of, uh, in Cologne of the lady lying. It's exactly the same as you see there. Um, so um, he just started with the idea of painting a second version of this painting, and then he changed his idea, turned it 90 degrees, and started with a Saint Jerome. Till now, we talked if Van Dijk did more or less everything on his own. But is that true? We already saw from the anecdote that there were doubts about it. Van Dijk, Van Dijk was teached by Rubens, who had a huge workshop. Are there clues that also Van Dijk worked with assistants and pupils? Before we will look at some of the paintings more closely to see if we can find other hands than Van Dijk's own, it's important to look what we know from 17th century documents. Unfortunately, the documents that exist from Van Dijk's use are very rare, and they don't tell us much about his workshop practice. There are, however, a whole series of documents of 1660, 1661, thus uh, 20 years after the death of Van Dyck, which are about paintings he made when he was young, when he was about 20. They are extremely important because in the documents, painters, painters who were closely related or friends to Van Dyck had their say. What are all these documents about? In 1660, the canon of Antwerp Cathedral, François Hillewerve, bought 12 apostles and the Christ on the advice of Jan Breugel the Younger. For a while, this François Hillewerve was very proud of his new possession and he showed it to several people, among them Rubens. Um, but then, after a time, um, no, that's not possible. He didn't, didn't show it to Rubens, of course, because he was already long dead. So that's uh, nonsense. At least he showed it them to several people, and they did like it. But then some other painters who came to see it, they said, uh-uh, these are not the originals you bought. These are copies. So there was that Francois Hillewerver went to the city magistrate of Antwerp, and then investigations were held. And during these investigations, a whole series of people was interviewed, among them some who had worked to together closely Van Dijk during his early years before he went to Italy. The man who had ordered the series from the artist was also still alive. It was Guillaume Verhagen, a coat maker, a huik maker, who had bought the series according to himself around 45 years ago, uh, but he added directly that he didn't know exact the date, and in fact it was we think about 40 years ago, so around 1618, 1620. He said that it had taken a lot of time to get the series finished by Van Dijk. Verhagen had got several times to the painter to ask if he could hurry up a little bit. When the paintings were finished, Verhagen said to Van Dijk that some look better than others. Van Dijk answered that all things are not the same and that they were all of high quality and made by his own hand. When an assistant of Van Dijk delivered the series finally at Verhagen's house, he asked if he, uh, to Verhagen if he would allow him to copy some of them. <coughs> Eventually, according to Verhagen, this assistant copied two or three of the versions of the series of uh, apostles. Verhagen told that the greatest Antwerp, uh, artist of Antwerp, like Rubens, uh, had praised the series. Next to the man who bought the series, Verhagen, a very important witness in the court case was Herman Servaas. Herman Servaas told he had been working with Van Dijk 
when the Apostle series was made. He told he had seen Van Dyck made the original series and that he and others had made copies after them, which, he had, which had been retouched by Van Dyck afterwards. He saw, so Herman Serfa saw, that one of the paintings in the series, which Verhage had bought, was by his hand, but he was not completely sure. The whole series was, according to him, made up of retouched copies. Justus van Egmond, another painter, another witness in the, in the case, did not agree. He saw that some of the series were absolute originals by Van Dyck, but also he saw that most of them were retouched copies. As said, also Justus van Egmond had worked with Van Dyck during the time he had made the Apostles. And also he saw that one or two might be by him, but also he did, was not sure about it. From these two assistants or pupils of Van Dyck, we learn that at almost the same time as the originals of the Apostles, assistants made copies. They were retouched by Van Dyck. Some other witnesses, which were heard, said that Van Dyck sometimes retouched very much and sometimes hardly anything. Presumably, he did much if they didn't look like his work and did hardly anything if he was already satisfied with the result. It is clear from the witnesses Servaas and Egmond that Van Dyck had the copies made on his own instigation and sold them as originals. Remarkably, is, it is that one of his assistants, when delivering the panels to Verhage, asked him if he might copy some of them. This suggests that he did this without the knowledge of Van Dyck. Why would he otherwise ask it? So, also, assistants went on their own to make copies without Van Dyck knowing it. Jan Breugel the Younger, who, as said, grew up with Van Dyck, said that the painter was used to make two or more versions on one painting, which were so similar that one, one could hardly see any difference. The art dealer Musson, on the other hand, denied Breugel's statement and said that Van Dyck never made a second version himself, but that he did retouch second versions who had been made by his assistants. At the end, the court thought there was clear proof that the paintings who were bought by François Hellewerf were not all by Van Dyck. What to make of these documents? It is clear that Van Dyck, when still in his teens, worked with assistants like his former master Rubens. His assistants made copies after his compositions, which Van Dyck retouched sometimes completely, sometimes not at all, and everything in between. Likely, he sold his copies as originals, at least he did with Guillaume Verhage. And those two assistants we know of, so both Herman Servaas and Justus van Egmond, were of the same age as Van Dyck. So you don't have, uh, if you look at that studio Van Dyck had when he was 18, 19 years, it doesn't look like it were young pupils who learned the, the craft of painting. It were more friends of his same age who helped him, perhaps more or less freelance when he had much to do. It looks more that kind of studio than that was a really studio with, uh, where he was really the teacher, say more or less. Um, let's go back to the paintings. Um, is there something visible? Here we have two versions I already showed you of uh, Saint Jude, one of the apostles. This is the one from Vienna, which is in the collection, uh, which is in the exhibition. And this is the one from Rotterdam. And especially the head is wonderfully painted in the, the Rotterdam painting, but the one in Vienna is much more freely painted. And especially, I think, uh, if you look at uh, the closest, they are extremely stiff and wooden, I would say. So if anything, there might be assistant working. And clearly it was retouched by Van Dijk quite heavily. It looks like, of course, it's not completely clear. Uh, another case where the quality of the painting is perhaps not as good is the. Uh, where is my. Yeah. This figure. If you compare it with the other heads in the painting, it really looks very, very wooden. So perhaps here we see an assistant working. Um, for the same question. Is there resistant or not? We will look a little bit closer again to the two St. Jerome's. But before that, 
we have to look if we can say something about the sequence. Can it be made clear that he first painted one version and only then a second version for sure? Or perhaps they were made more or less on the same time. It's of course possible. There are a few details which clearly show, in at least in this painting, that Rotterdam was first and then on the basis of the Rotterdam, the version in Stockholm is made. The best example, I think, is the blue drapery. Here, uh, on top of the wing. It's clearly visible that first the angel was painted without the blue drapery. drapery. The wing clearly shimmers through the blue. Um, it's less clearly visible with the arm, but we took a paint sample and also there, first the arm was painted and then the blue drapery. Um, if you look at the Stockholm version, and you have especially look at the original in the show, but if you look here and here, <laughs> no, and on the other side, you even can see the ground. So here, he really knew, the man who made the second version, that the blue drapery would be there. So the wing doesn't go under the blue drapery and even left a space open where the blue drapery should come and he didn't fill it in completely. So you really see the ground on either side of the blue drapery. The same holds true for the, the legs of Saint Jerome. Uh, in first instance, uh, the legs were not visible in the Stockholm, uh, for, uh, Stockholm version and you can only see his feet. So the red went on and you didn't see the naked legs. In the second version in Stockholm, clearly from the start, the legs were visible. So again, you see Pentimenti in the Rotterdam and not in the Stockholm. So here clearly Van Dijk started with the Rotterdam and then the one in Stockholm were made. Let's look somewhat closer to the style of both paintings. In first instance, they look very, very much the same. The one in Stockholm is signed. You see it here, Avendank. It's one of the two paintings signed from his early period. Uh, he almost never signed, but this one is done. It's, it's interesting to know why it was signed. Perhaps because it went abroad or something. We don't know. It's, it's just, uh, it's at least very remarkable. Um, the still life is a little bit driven, and, and, and as said, it's very sketch-like. It's doesn't, it's, there is no difference in quality, I would say. Look at the arm. Uh, they are both, again, very sketchy. And in both, the perspective is not completely solved. That's strange, because one would expect that in the second version, he would try to adjust it. But clearly, the idea of the sketchiness was more important than a good perspective and anatomy. Here also the quality is, I think, equal. The body is perhaps a little bit better painted in Rotterdam, but it's, it's, it's very well done in, in the Stockholm one. And I think if the Rotterdam painting didn't exist, nobody would ever have doubted the Stockholm one. There are some details where the Rotterdam painting is much more fluent and sketchy. Uh, here you can see uh, with the leaves in the left corner, left you see Rotterdam, and on the right, you see the ones in uh, Stockholm, and they are extremely stiff. So if ever anywhere it looks like in dire, you see an assistant at work. Perhaps the, the best detail, uh, at least I like it the most, is the quill. Uh, in the Rotterdam version, it's sharply cut, like a good quill should be. But in the Stockholm version, it's just a stroke of the brush without any detail. In fact, it's ending in nothing. Is this the difference between the master and his assistant or pupil? It might very well be. So what we, what we learn from the documents might indeed be visible in some of the paintings. But it's always very hard to say where exactly the assistant's work is present. As we have seen, Van Dijk was very, uh, very able to imitate the animal-like style of Rubens, and at the same time, uh, 
paint in a style completely other, in a very rough way, in its more or less own style. You can say that there is not one specific Van Dijk style. He had several. Thus, if we see different styles in one painting, it's not necessarily that we see two painters at work. One thing is that if a part of a painting is technically perhaps not as good as another part, this may be an indication of assistant, but it might just as well be Van Dijk himself on an off day or just not concentrated. When Van Dijk retouched the work of his assistants when the paint was still wet, there is no way for us to see a difference between the two stages when you look at a paint sample. The paint has completely mixed. And even if we can see striking pentimenti, it is might just as well be Van Dijk reforking his earlier version. From the documents on the Apostle series, we have seen that even assistants working with the master were not completely sure if they had worked on that series. They thought that they recognized one or two, but they were not sure. So the thing we can learn from this is that we, almost 400 years later, should be extremely careful when attributing things to assistant approvals. Before I end the talk, let's look again at the anecdote I mentioned at the start. Nobelius mentioned three things which were important to know if one looked at a painting and had to judge if it was a copy or not. It was important to know if there were paintings with the same subject, with the same composition, and the same measurements. The problem, of course, is, is how do we how we have to understand these words? Subject seems to be clear. But what to make, uh, for example, of these two apostles? Uh, the one on the right is Simon, which is in the show, and on the left is Matthew, so a completely different subject. But clearly, they are, have exactly the same measurements. They have the same uh, prototype. So is this a copy? In one way, it should be. But of course, it's not, because it's just a completely different subject. Then. Composition. What did Nobelius mention with it? The crowning of swords. Is that the same composition? In our words, it is more or less the same composition, but on the other hand, of course, a lot has been changed. It's also even true for this painting. Yeah, there are, in the details in the still life, there are some very small changes. So is this really a second version or could he sell it as an original new painting? You can hardly believe it, but of course there are some changes. Um, measurements, uh, the third point, the taking of Christ, uh, they are all three in completely uh, different uh, measurements they have, but of course they are very clearly related to each other. Of course they are all a little bit different in composition, but on the other hand we can directly see that they come from the same source. Um, so it's hard, if not impossible, to say what Van Dijk and his contemporaries started to call uh, uh, a painting an original or a copy. Uh, quality seems to have been of great importance. Eh? If we look at the documents, um, also, like nowadays, the most important thing is still quality. Uh, one might even think that the whole idea of versions was considered as problematic as it is now. There was certainly not a definition for it which was generally used. Every art dealer or every artist might, must have been had his own definition. In the beginning of my lecture, I also said that it was remarkable how sketchy most of Van Dijk's works look, and that his works almost look like impressionist painters. But I hope I've made clear that behind every painting, there's a good deal of preparation. Van Dijk's style makes him a, perhaps a proto-impressionist, his technique and the way he prepared his paintings are certainly not. He prepared his compositions with a whole range of drawings, trying to look for the best solution. For the positions of his figures, he made separate drawings. For the head, he had separate older stories. The story of Jan Breugel, in first instance, appears as he was painting from a live model, eh? if he had Peter de Jode just in front of him and painted him. But very likely, there was at least one stage in between. Van Dijk must have made, in first instance, a throne, a study head, very likely on paper, which must have been the example and starting point for his apostle he was working on. 
Van Dijk didn't make such a lot of paintings in such a short time because he just started painting on the canvas without preparation as an impressionist. Clearly not. Making second and third versions of the same composition will certainly have helped him with enlarging his production. Of the apostles, we have still dozens. Also, we know he had assistants who helped him with making these versions. But it seems that there were never many more than two or three. His studio was certainly not comparable with Rubens' workshop. At the end, it was above all Van Dijk's own ability to work fast that made it possible to make so many paintings. Van Dijk was extremely talented and very eager to compete with Rubens. In his early years, he must have worked extremely hard, and it's exactly this what he told later on in life to his friend Jabach, and Christopher Brown showed the portrait of Jabach by Van Dijk. He told Van Dijk, uh, Van Dijk told Jabach that he had worked, when he was very young, very hard, just to make his name and to learn how to paint quick. So to conclude, we know Van Dijk worked fast, but he studied a lot. We know that he had assistance, not that much as Rubens, but still. We know uh, we, uh, that there were already discussions about the question if the paintings were original, originals almost di directly after they were made, after they almost left the studio, there were already discussions, like the story of Nobeliers and, Ger and Gerbier, but also the assistants who talked in the 60s, 60s, who were, couldn't agree if some uh, apostles were originals or not. And of course, the discussion will never stop. Alejandro and I have tried to find some solutions, but of course, a whole lot of questions are still very open, and it's to you, the new students, who will have to continue the discussion. Thank you. <laughs>